Young American Brothers and Sisters who took the time out today to join us. I had an opportunity, <laughs> I had an opportunity to <laughs> hang out with them a little bit last night and uh, it was really great and I'm just uh, really honored that they made the time to come and join us this morning. And then I also want to acknowledge uh, Michael in the back. Michael was uh, my driver uh, <coughs> around yesterday and uh, Akimi, where are you? My other driver, she picked me up at the airport and is making sure that I get to all the places that I'm going to. So I um, I feel like I'm with family, right? No taxi, none of that. Like if you're in Seattle, you all do it right, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just really, uh, really excited and happy to be here. There are two things that I'm supposed to do uh, in this morning's session, and I'm gonna try to do it in a timely way. Um, one is I want to share with you a little bit my personal experience in being um, an elected. Um, why does that matter? I think that it's important for you as organizers to see why and how the work that you do have an impact for those of us who choose to run for office and why it matters, right? <clears throat> why it matters. And then secondly, I, I just want to share with you a couple of observations that, that I've had maybe more like reflections uh, that I've had since I've um, uh, left public life. Um, and then after lunch, I think, I'm going to come back and kind of close us out a little bit by just sharing some um, tips uh, about, you know, when you're actually out there engaging with the public and you're going to actually execute. What are some things to just kind of think about? And hopefully I'll be able to have enough time to share with you some really funny stories that has happened to, uh, to me and our campaign. So in 2001, my, uh, my state senator got elected mayor unexpectedly um, uh, in my city. There was a vacancy. Um, and since he had been doing this job for almost like, I don't know, 12 years, um, and everyone thought he was going to be a lifer, uh, nobody was really thinking about you know, succession, nobody was really planning uh, on, uh, on any kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of thinking about that they would want to run for that, that state senate seat. Um, but what usually happens is that when an open seat gets created unexpectedly, right, you know, everybody, their grandmother and their dog, suddenly says, well, I want to run for that office. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, you know, full disclosure, full disclosure, this is a nonpartisan event, right? Nonpartisan event. Um, but I, um, uh, in, on my side of the aisle, uh, there were eight candidates, eight candidates who decided that they wanted to run for the office. I uh, was a practicing attorney uh, in a rather large corporate firm in downtown Minneapolis. Um, but I've taken a leave of absence to, to do some consulting work with a couple of my um, community clients who really couldn't afford to pay the legal fees but really needed the hand-holding to do the work that, um, that they needed to. So they asked me, they, they got together and said, if we pay you a consulting fee, will you take a leave of absence and work with us? And so I was, I, I had taken a leave of absence in August and then in uh, November, my mayor, my senator got elected mayor and um, Actually, at the end of October, my consulting work had finished, and we were waiting for January of the new year to start with the second phase of the project that we're all working on together. For the first time in my life in a long time, uh, I was stuck with a couple of months where I didn't have anything to do. Um, and that's very dangerous. Um, so this is a special election, right? From November um, to January, basically. And the person who get who wins will actually get sworn in on like February 4th or something like that. <clears throat> so my state representative, whom I thought was going to be a candidate, met with me for coffee. Politicians always meet with you for coffee when they want to ask you to, 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 to help them, right? I did that all the time, right? So we're having coffee and I said to him, I said, well, so are you going to ask me? Because he was my really good friend. He knew that I had nothing, I had, you know, I didn't have anything to do for a couple of months. And I thought he was going to ask me to manage his campaign, you know, for the state senate seat. So I was really excited. So I said, well, aren't you going to ask me? And he said, ask you what? And then, aren't you going to ask me to manage your campaign for the senate race? And he says, uh-uh, I'm not going anywhere near that. I'm like, why not? He says, I, I'm really happy where I am, you know, in the house. I'm really happy where I am. So I said, well, if you're not running, who's running? So he started giving me a list of people. I'm like, ugh. Ew, ish, you know? <laughs> Suddenly, after I had done a lot of ishing and ooing, he looked at me and he said, you know, you should run. And I looked at him like, why? He said, because a lot of people think that, you know, you bring a lot of integrity to the process and people like you. You really should think about it. And I, I, I didn't react uh, right away, but as I was driving home and I was, you know, on the way home, I started thinking about that. 
And I thought, man, it would be really fun. It would be really fun. Because it really is only, you know, November, December, and January. For three months, I have nothing to do. <laughs> and, and you know what? I don't really care if I win or not. Think about that. How liberating is it? How liberating is it to say, I don't really care if I win or not. Because whether I win or not, we're already winning, right? We're already winning. I have a job to go back to. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't have to sacrifice anything. This is a win-win. And you know, from with the heart of a community organizer, right? I mean, you see an opportunity like that, you're like, wow, like how cool is this? Okay, you're all laughing. But I really felt like it was very cool. So it's because one, I didn't, I didn't know if I would win, right? That I decided that I would jump into the race. Plus, I thought it would be a great opportunity to organize. And in the Senate district that, that, that I ultimately came to represent, it was very much like this new congressional district that you guys are working in. Uh, great transformation took place. The census, um, I, I got elected in a special election you know, in the year that the census uh, were coming out. So we were in the two year cycle of the redistricting. Um, and it was a brand new um, Senate district where um, there were a lot of Asian Americans who had moved into that district. We could, we could tell from the census tract. And I live in that district and I know, I mean, really, <coughs> all of my family members on my husband's side of the family and my side of the family were living in that Senate district, right? So um, I thought it would be really fun to use it as an organizing opportunity. So I jumped into the race, right? We made the decision, and then people heard about it, so we announced it to the press. And then suddenly I said, oh my God, I have to put a campaign team together, <laughs> right? Never took any campaigns or elections classes, didn't know anything about it. Um, I took a continued legal, educa legal education class on campaigns and elections. So I went to my office, and I dug up this, this uh, CLE um, three-ring binder that sort of laid out, you know, like when you run a campaign, these are the roles that, these are the jobs that you need to do in this campaign, right? And I went through and read through all the different job descriptions, and I basically pulled them out. And then I called a meeting of all my first cousins. <laughs> I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest of about 60 first cousins between my mom's side of the family, my mom's one of eight, and my dad's side of the family, my dad is one of six. Remember, they all live in the district, right? <laughs> And I called them and I said, well, you read in the paper, I'm gonna do this. So, uh, so I just looked at my cousins and I said, okay, you're gonna be the campaign manager and you're gonna be the finance person and you're gonna be the field organizer and uh, well, you're just gonna keep my calendar. And they all looked at me and they're like, what does this mean? I said, I don't know, read the job description. <laughs> you went to Yale, you went to Brown, you went to Brandeis, you can figure this out. Right? So, so when, it, when they all looked at it and they're like, oh, man, I said, listen, I bought a lot of popcorn for you all. I was the first person to know how to drive and I drove one of those giant conversion vans that were really popular in the 80s. And I put all my first cousins in and I paid for all the outdoor movie theater tickets. Payback time today. <laughs> and they, they all said, okay, okay, we'll, we'll help you. None of us knew what we were doing. But you know what changed all for us? Is that we didn't know what we were doing and we were much more earnest about uh, the tasks in front of us. And our goal was to not just to win the election, but our goal was that by the end of the three month campaign, it didn't matter if we won the election or not, we were going to dramatically change the voter base on the East Side so what we did was, once they all agreed that they would work on my campaign, uh, my husband and I went to the county, and we, from somewhere we got a map uh, of the entire district by precinct. And then we, we actually got a map of every single household that was um, on the east side of St. Paul. Dots on every block. And, and we basically, uh, my brother-in-law took and he broke that giant map down, and he took it um, like by five block and blew it up. And we actually had a night where we had a group of people, this many people in uh, volunteers, all my moms and her first cousins and my, my, uh, my auntie and all her first cousins. Nobody could speak English, but they could count, and they could count in long. So we had them sit down, <laughs> and they went through a packet that was this big, and they virtually count the number of dots on every block. 
And we were able to calculate block by block, precinct by precinct, exactly how many households were on each of those blocks. And the reason we wanted to do that is that it was our intention after the campaign to have hit every single household in every block in every precinct on the east side of St. Paul. So using that, then we put up a huge precinct map, and then we knew, based on the Secretary of State's uh, information, where it was that the concentration of voters. And so we, we marked, you know, we color-coded all the areas where, where in the precincts where historically there were high voter turnout. And then we ignored those areas. And we looked at the white spaces, and that was our opportunity, and those were the areas that we actually created the campaign to harvest, right? In that first election, I spent $65,000. I spent $65,000. Minnesota has same-day voter registration. And because it was a special election, right, we weren't going to go to people's door and ask them to register to vote. Because if we did that and the ballots didn't get in, they, they've already registered, but they didn't show up on the ballot, they couldn't vote. So what we did was we, we contacted everyone and then we concentrated and provided them information about what they need to take with them the day of in order to vote. And we needed that for two reasons. One is, if we could concentrate, we, if we could get everyone to register to vote the day of, then once they get into the system, we could then look at the, the voter turnout by the date of their voter registration, and we could attribute back to our campaign the number of people we actually brought up to vote the day of. Because right? it was important for us to try to track that. We spent $65,000 from the campaign. We got, between the primary and the election, we got over 3,000 people to come out to vote. 3,000 people. On, on any given year, a really good turnout number on the east side of St. Paul is anywhere between 13,000 to 20,000. You don't think that 3,000 brand new votes that are mine is gonna make a difference in the election, right? So, so if you do the math, it's about $21.67 per vote. Do you think you would be willing to spend $21.67 if you could get someone who's solidly out to vote and committed to the process? You bet you would. And, and my commitment then was in every election cycle, I would raise and spend sixty-five dollars to $67,000 if in every election cycle I could bring at least 3,000 people and get them out there to vote for $21.67. Uh, um, the other, uh, so the two thing, the, the other thing that really helped me to raise the, the $65,000 is that uh, in Minnesota we have a program called the uh, Political Contrib uh, Contribution Refund Program. It's a state checkoff program. People can choose to donate a dollar of their return to this fund. For candidates who <coughs> choose uh, to go with public subsidy or public funding, meaning that we can't be a Mitt Romney, because super PACs weren't in yet, right? You, we can't, you can't spend your own money. If you consent to, to public funding, you get a receipt with a special number on it. Every contribution that you get from somebody in the state who is eligible to vote in the state of Minnesota, you give them a receipt. And up to $50 of the contribution will get refunded back to them by the state. My base and my people, they don't have a lot of money to give, but if, in essence, they could loan me the $50, I give them the receipt and they can get that money back from the state. They're like, of course, we want to support you. We're willing to loan you that $50, right? Now, I didn't put a big billboard that says, come loan me your $50 to get it back from the state. But when we did the conversation, it was just like, you know, I know it's really hard, I know times are hard, but you know, I mean, Give me what you can. Even if you gave me twenty dollars, you'll get your twenty dollars back. You can get up to fifty dollars back. And what I was finding is people were saying, "Wow, I'm going to give you fifty for that receipt because I feel like I'm not really contributing to you, but I'll give you another fifty. That's really my real contribution." And we ended up then get, getting double for the money because people really felt like they wanted to give it. 